I met, I'll say this further on. But when did we meet, Mark? I think we met at Donald's. What was the address? 113 West 11th? 113 11? West 11th. And one of his wives who wrote that uh, book, she got the address wrong. Can I tell you an amazing story to start about that? No, 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 please. This is Rod. I didn't know Donald bought me. He was just starting up. He just arrived in New York in 1962 or 63. And I had recently divorced and was about to remarry. And my new wife, Carol, and I were looking for apartments. And we looked all over New York. And we found an apartment in the village that was almost exactly right. We, the Westfield, just west of 6th Avenue. And it was almost exactly right. We loved it. It went through the garden and back. But there wasn't enough room for my two young children. It was just one little room. So we moved and we ended up on East 94th Street. Then I met Donald. He submitted some just funny little casual pieces to the New York and not yet bossed me ask. And uh, in conversation, the next uh, day or the next day, he said, I said, where do you live? And he said, I just moved into a new apartment at 113 West 11th. The exact same apartment we had almost bought out of all the apartments in New York. An absolutely astounding coincidence. Think of the millions of apartments in New York. And we almost moved into the same apartment. And I went back to that apartment many, many times over the years. Just so, wow. So there was something special between us right from the start. A huge mathematical uh, thrill. So that's where I met Roger, was in, at, at Donald's. And at Donald used to hold uh, at parties. I think it was one of the closest things to me, at least, uh, to the sort of fabulous world of literary forays in Proust and other places. And there were, R Roger was one of the most awesome figures in it. And uh, uh, Lane de Kooning and, uh, um, and anyway, a host of people were uh, there who I wanted to meet. Susan Sontag, et cetera, Every, this sort of golden... I wanted to meet her, too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's where I first met Roger. Anyway, every now and then we would have a party for the magazine since we all worked on it for nothing, including Donald. And uh, I, uh, I kept the magazine alive by being extremely frugal. So we would uh, put out a rather cheap scotch for the rest of the... Uh, <laughs> the rest of the... Uh, cast. But uh, Donald <laughs> warned me in advance that if he was going to show up, he wanted a decent scotch, and he named it. I believe his favorite was Peaches. But Roger... Yeah, hard to get Peaches. Yeah. Roger named Dewey's as his favorite. And so I went to the uh, Astor place <laughs> and bought you uh, a decent amount of Dewey's. Thank you very much. That's about <laughs> four evenings. And, no, no. <laughs> So that, uh, thank you, thank you, Mark. He would not be disappointed, <laughs> and that uh, he would have something palpable uh, to remember the evening by. Uh, well. So I, I prepared some remarks, I, and you can cut me off at any. Uh, so, Roger Angel and I both belong to a secret society. Uh, of course, membership changes particularly over the almost 20 years between Roger's graduation and mine. I remember my first glance at Roger in the space of an, I think I'll sit down. Yes, yeah, sit down. <laughs> of an elegant uh, room on West 11th Street, thinking, this is the ideal, and I am only a counterfeit representation. Okay. What really links us, however, is not our college, but the writer Donald Bartholomew. Reading Roger's essays on Donald, both in his memoir, Let Me Finish, and this old man, not only brought, Don brought, brought Donald, but Roger's appreciation. It frames what makes Bartholomew's work so unique in, works, in words that ring true. This is uh, Roger speaking. Categories seemed to accumulate around him of their own accord, but a brief rundown of some common ingredient in his fiction brings back his unique swirl of colors and contexts, museums, headlines, orchestras, bishops, and other clerics, babies, savants, and philosophers, young women, angels, and a panoply of names, Goethe, Edward Lear, Clay, Bluebeard, Cortez, and Montezuma, Sinbad, President Eisenhower, Eugenie, Frangent, Snow White, Hokey Mokey, the King of Jazz, this explosion of reference, this bottomless etc. 
probably accounted for his brevity, short stories and short novels, and for the beauty of his prose. His names and nouns were set down in a manner that magically carried memories and overtones, bringing them intact to the page where they let loose in the reader a responding flood of recognition, irony, and sadness. Donald was erudite and culturally rigorous, but he was always terrifically funny as well. And when his despairing characters and ragged scenes and sudden stops and starts had you tumbling wildly, free-falling through a story, it was a laughter that kept you afloat and made you feel that there would probably be a safe landing. Roger, in explaining the genius of Sean, the editor-in-chief of the New Yorker, who sat above him, recalls, he loved the baffling, mysteriously moving first Donald Bothamy stuff, and in 1965 saw at once that we would absolutely have to take his short novel, Snow White, in its entirety. Snow White dreaming of a prince while she lives in a close domestic arrangement with Bill, Hubert, Henry, Kevin, Edward, Clem, and Dan. <laughs> and at one point complaining, I'm tired of just being a horsewife. <laughs> a horsewife, I've forgotten that. <laughs> I, su I suppose we'll have a lot of complaints about this, Sean said to me, but who cares? <laughs> when it's the real thing. In the lament Can I break in for one yes, second please, there? Please. We had so many complaints from readers. It filled up a whole issue. Uh, New York had much more fiction back then, but this, this novel filled up a whole issue. And there was all, always an audience for Bartholomew, but there was another audience that didn't get him at all. And people, mostly without any sense of humor, uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of anger even among staff people, where we kept running this marvelous guy. And, but the, we got so many letters from readers about Snow White, this whole wild, beautiful novel, that I actually wrote a sort of a, a little interpretation about a one-page explanation of what was going on, how it would loosen your mind and perhaps uh, just let it flow over you. I don't think we ever did that with any other thing we published, <coughs> sort of a trot. <laughs> yep. So I go on? Right? Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, please. This yeah, is your yeah. idea, not mine. In the lament, or to use Donald's teasing word, litany, mourning both Donald's passing and contemporary indifference to his work, entreating us to read it again, Roger wrote, an older man, also a writer and a contributor, said almost the same thing. He always seemed to be writing about my trashiest thoughts and my night fears and my darkest secrets, but he understood them better than I did, and he seemed to find them sweeter and classier than I ever could. For a long time, I felt that he, I was going to be all right as long as he was around and writing. Having him for a friend was the greatest compliment of my life. I can say I to that. Though I know Roger Angel principally through very brief conversations at the wonderful parties that I was privileged to attend as a friend of Donald's. Through moments of experiencing Roger's wit, wisdom, and penetrating understanding <coughs> have also been among the great compliments of my life. One of just a minute took place when by accident, as in his own tale of brief accidental meetings with celebrities, we happened to meet on the busy streets of Manhattan. Roger, knowing of my curiosity about Bruno Schultz, the Polish Jewish writer whose work had been published in the New Yorker before a subsequent publication in book form, stopped to comment on the superiority of the New Yorker's translation before he strode briskly on. Reading through this old man, his latest book, I was struck by that same attention to words, quoting Donald, the brown, hard, nut-like word. I, I'm sure he culled that from somewhere else. Yeah, that's 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 <laughs> I haven't found it yeah. yet. Thoreau. <laughs> Think Thoreau. I, I thought I knew my Thoreau. <laughs> and to people that, have, people that have always made me regard him with the same awe that I felt for his friend, one of America's great prose stylists, Donald Bothamy, an awe which I know Donald felt for Roger, both as a writer, an editor, and the best of friends. Writing about Donald, trying to explain what drew me to him, I find myself falling back on the words of Kent to King Lear. You have that in your countenance, which I would fain call master. <coughs> What's that, the king asked, and has answered, authority. Donald felt that authority in Roger. Just listening to the way memoir and literary criticism comes together in Roger Angel's brief but telling essay 
on the Hudson River of his childhood in Mock Plains, Mississippi River in the novel Huckleberry Finn, drawn into a, carmen, a common current by a single word, sliding, leaves me breathless. It's in just a few paragraphs, Roger touches on one of the mysteries of that quintessential American novel. I'm reminded of how stunned I was after toiling through the tedious volumes of Edgar Johnson, <coughs> former chairman of this, uh, uh, to read Edmund Wilson's short but essential essay on the great British writer. Roger, in fact, repeating V.S. Pritchett's mixed criticism and appreciation of Edmund Wilson, cannily teases them both. Wilson, quote, is called an awkward, phlegmatic, egotistical <laughs> writer, but at the same moment becomes the recipient of a rush of world-class compliments that say things about him which he, even he himself has perhaps not perceived. He can't complain because he's been taken seriously and originally. <coughs> I think that speaks to what makes Roger Angel so formidable, both as an editor and an essayist. Reading a letter of Roger's to Ann Beattie, rejecting a story, I have to say that I'm jealous. <laughs> it would have been enough not to have a story accepted by him, but to have received such a telling note. As Thoreau remarks, it's rare that one gets seriously looked at. Huh? Roger has promised us a ramble, and I hope that he will let us tag along with him for a while. I will, unless uh, uh, he shuts me up, with a question I note that in your memoir, let me finish, when in your, remarking about Donald's passing in a poignant sentence, a tribute to yourself of Veronica Gang. As long as he's here in the same city with me, we'll all be, we'll be all right, I used to think. Or was that something Veronica Gang said? I'm quoting now from... Uh, I think that was Veronica who said it. Wait, yeah, wait, sorry, no, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but in this old man, I recall two colleagues lamenting Donald, a woman who remains anonymous, and a man, the latter in, a much, more in much more specific words that I just quoted. In Let Me Finish, you say you can't remember exactly what Mayor Lagardia said to you during your high school interview with him, but in This Old Man, the later book, you recall conversation in detail. I made it up. <laughs> well, I think your memory is getting better and better. <laughs> your remarks about memory intrigue me. And I wonder if in preparing two separate books that in several instances go over the same subjects, you experience memory differently. And you write, memory is fiction, an anecdotal version of some scene or past event we need to store away for present or future use. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, that's extraordinary. Um, let's get back to Donald for a minute. The thing that made him seem so essential was the time in which he was running, which was the 60s and the 70s, which were chaotic and uh, terrifying. Maybe like what we're just starting in on, it's just possible, it's very possible. And, uh, he wasn't calming. He was he was flowing and uh, enigmatic, and uh, sad, and funny, and made you feel smart because there were so many references. There were so many intellectual and artistic little t tugs that remember things that you almost knew. Uh, Kennedy, the, the the title Robert Kennedy saved from drowning, which. Peggy and I just looked up to remind myself again where that came from. That came from a French film released in 1930, Voodoo Saved from Drowning, but Robert Kennedy Saved from Drowning was just like Donald. He turned things around and put two things in your mind at the same time which you wouldn't expect, which he does all the time. Um, and to have somebody as intelligent and as erudite and so full of immediate reference, things that were happening right around you that you almost recognized, <coughs> Uh, was a way of, uh, I guess, thinking there was somebody smarter than you and maybe more cheerful than you and more grown up than you, uh, who could also laugh at the same time that carried you through. The times were very much uh, 
the, what made Donald himself. And I think this is what maybe has stated him. Very few people read him now. I went with Mark told me he was going to come up here. Thank you very much. It's so, such a pleasure to meet you all. And uh, I don't get to see students much anymore. And I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. But um, I've forgotten what I was about to say. <laughs> Donald uh, in his time. He can't read Bartholomew anymore. I'm sorry. <coughs> Donald in his well, time. But, but also, him now. Yeah, but uh, I've, I've started to read him again just in the last couple of weeks. And wondering, I've not done it. I've not read him for a while. He died in 1989. And I've not read him for a while. And I used to know him by heart. And I started reading him again. And I, I hoped this hadn't gone away. I hoped it hadn't dated. It has dated a little bit. It really has. Uh, it didn't always work the way it did, but, and I thought at first, uh-oh, I don't want to go on with this. But then after just two or three stories, suddenly the same feeling came over, the same feeling of excitement and pleasure and giving myself to what was on the page and letting it flow over me. I think that there are a couple of essentials in reading, you know, the things that really help in reading Donald. I um, wonder if you know anything about art, because I think that art was the greatest influence in his life, aside from his parental his background education. But he was an art curator before he was a young curator of modern art in Houston. And he actually brought René Magritte, the great Belgian uh, <coughs> surrealist, to, to, to Houston. And, and which was, imagine that he was in his 20s and got Magritte to come, I think, or was involved in it anyway. And, uh, so there are constant references to, to artists, and he works like artists. He works like Duchamp, he works like Magritte, uh, Peggy, who I have a wonderful wife, Peggy here, who is a teacher and also a wonderful artist and, a, and an art uh, critic, thinks that uh, Joseph Cornell might be the closest and the maker of those beautiful little boxes where you see unexpected colors and shapes side by side. Uh, this happens all the way through his writing. Um, and uh, I think move you in, in a way that you don't think, you, you don't quite know what is happening to you. Do you, do you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, his joy <coughs> in the first issues of fiction is actually bringing together drawings and, yeah, and yeah, lot with yeah. and, and playing but, them off against yeah. one another. The drawings came a little bit later, but I think the, fir the, the first piece where you can see, one of the early pieces where you can see what he's doing is called The Falling Dog. And he walks out of a building and the dog falls out of the sky and knocks him flat on the pavement. <laughs> this is an artistic reference. This is a reference to a guy named Ernest Trova, who at that time was painting a really very popular and wonderful series called The Falling Man, where there's paintings of a man falling over in different postures, half, half on the ground, wonderfully done. And and so popular that people have them in posters all over. So this is the falling dog. And uh, <coughs> the, the, uh, the thoughts about the dog include lists. There's a first group of lists. Uh, and there's a, group of, there's a group of painters who painted dogs. And there's a, there's a long list of, of dogly references, dog-eared, uh, dogged, dog-girl, uh, on and <laughs> on, everything with it. Uh, dog on. Uh, and then, what's the, I'm trying to think, there's a reference to a, uh, a plastic tray. What would that be, a dog thing? I can't, I can't remember, but. Uh, Say again? Dharma. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, um, you can see him trying this all out, which worked, worked its way much more enigmatically and successfully into later things. No, there's <coughs> long lists like Yeah, uh, yeah. Miss Mandible. Miss Mandible. The, uh, the wonderful, Eddie, the, the wonderful, Eddie and, uh, yeah. Those extraordinary titles. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to start the list in my mind. Uh, Debbie and Eddie, Debbie divorcing, Debbie is Liz. Kierkegaard unfair to Schlegel. Uh, <laughs> me and Miss Mandible at the policeman's ball, the falling dog. Uh, a late title of his Overnight to Many Distant Cities, a beautiful late story, sort of a summing up of his life in a way which is full of 
different. He was celebrated, celebrated author by the, by this time. This is in the mid '80s, I think, and a great teacher of writing at Houston. But he was idolized in European intellectual circles and was constantly invited over there to go to this or that conference. And uh, taking his taking his wife, and uh, it's about it's about marital love, it's about domestic love, it's about sexual <coughs> love, it's about beautiful places he's been to all around the world. And that title, Overnight to Many Distant Cities, he saw on a passing moving van and wrote it down. Think about that, think about that. Overnight to Many Distant Cities. Uh, that still just blows me away. <laughs> in Shower of Gold, I see he used college shoes in your uh, memoir. Yeah. Coward shoes come up, but not really. <laughs> hey, what are coward <laughs> shoes? Man, he doesn't wear coward shoes. What are coward shoes? So funny. But there's a there's a there's a layer of of, of uh, deep pleasure in the world and sensual pleasure and uh, love of women, love of children. But also, I think, a deeper layer of sadness that you feel all the way through it. And one of his books is called Sadness. And late in his life, there is a story called A Manual. For, this is an earlier reference to fathers. There's a wonderful title, one of his best titles, Views of My Father's Views of My Father Weeping. Now, just say that to yourself, everyone. Views of My Father Weeping. And that's already done something to every one of you. What is my father doing weeping? And, he's, and he says that this strange, again and again, his father is sitting on a bed, and he's weeping. He says, what can I do? How can I, why are you weeping? Uh, and he's going deep into our psyches at this moment, uh, and into his own. Right, and he's pretty brutal to us. Himself. That's right. And then later, I think 10 or 15 years later, I'm not a historian about this, there's this long piece called <coughs> A manual for sons, a manual for sons, which starts with 25 questions. And it is about the terrible problem we all have with our fathers, every one of us. Every one of us has to get over the power of a father and the love of our father and whoever our father is. And this is what Donald's writing about. And it's not easy reading it. It's almost impossible. Pay, pay your read this afternoon for the first time. It's almost impossible to read. It's so painful and so sad. And it's about his own life, his own father, I'm sure. But uh, written about in a way you, you still, I, I still take my breath away. We talked about it in my class today. And I said, I, when I read Views of My Father Weeping, I said, he's stolen a plot from some of them. And I know that plot, but where is it? I said, I thought it sounds like Tale of Two Cities. So sure enough. Really? Of, yes, because it's an aristocrat who runs over somebody. But in Donald's, in, in that's Donald's, right. There was the aristocrat. Yeah, yes. Right. yes. So, but he plays it back in a totally different way. It changes everything. But there's some <coughs> craziness in that. But yeah. It's always repurposing yeah. somebody else's work and making it better. But the remarkable thing is that you don't have to be particularly intellectual or deeply literary to understand these things <laughs> because you some part, if you've read at all or you or looked at art at all, some you have some of this part inside you and. And he touches on those things, and this is aroused something in me that you don't understand, but he, he understands what he's doing, or senses what he's doing. Um, the amazing part about this was that so many people didn't get him, as I said uh, before, talking about uh, Snow White. Uh, there was a lot of anger around. I mean, people I knew, people in the office said, what is this, what is this? And they thought it was all about smoking dope or something like that. Um, and as I've said, as you mentioned, the thing that happened was that I loved this stuff for some reason. And he and I had met and he trusted me and I, I, we had a nice relationship. I loved this stuff. I was the first reader. And the, the other last reader was the critical reader, who was William Sean, the editor, read every piece of fiction and said yes or no. And he got onto this right away. And said he didn't know if he, he couldn't understand it, but it was he just let it happen to. It was like poetry. Uh, and there have been many books about William Sean, uh, idolatrous books, critical books. I think they've now stopped. There have been too many. 
But the, almost none of them mentioned what a wonderful fiction editor he was. None of them, because fiction is sort of one side of what the New Yorker is more about reporting and cartoons and things. But the fiction is all to one side. And critics of of Sean and critics of the magazine are of home and fiction. But just he was a remarkably open editor of fiction. Of fiction, many of many of kinds of fiction we'd not seen before, which were happening all through the 60s and 70s and 80s. And uh, so we were very lucky to have someone like that around. <coughs> we had these coterie of friends who were poets, Kenneth Koch and Ashbury. You would always see them yeah. at those parties. Yeah. And then this, the, the, he would bring me along. And I, was, I, would, I was not an intellectual of the order of Don told me he was, he was formidable, intellectual and scholarly. And, Deeply admired and known in all these and people like, like uh, Gas and Barth and pe people like that were, they were all in a group called minimalists. Or, and, uh, but uh, I think he, he liked me also because I come from a different background. I was going to Harvard and I had with a long association with the New Yorker magazine. I was really waspy uh, <laughs> and he didn't know anybody else like me. <coughs> And at one point, this amazing thing happened. A friend of his named Harrison Starr. Remember Harrison? Oh, only too well. A fabulously <laughs> interesting, crazy uh, film guy who had worked on, who had been an assistant director with some famous foreign Italian director, not, I can't remember what, on what thing, and was a filmmaker and a close friend of Donald's, decided to make a, uh, Film models. What's what's that late story that the explanation? The late the late story, where the explanation, which has in the middle of it has four black boxes, and any Mac black boxes set right in the middle of the story, and it's all Q and A, and he made the film and he cast himself. It's the Q and A is between a sort of a swinging guy with a lot of long hair and jeans and everything that's contemporary, guy, <coughs> and a square guy with a jacket and uh, loafers. Me, I was, <laughs> I was the other guy, and we we were the two main actors in this thing. And he was made a sort of a major film, he, and he wanted to make a film of this. And we worked at this for about three weeks, starting in my bedroom at home where I'm getting dressed because he wanted to say he was the only guy he knew in New York who had still had garters holding up his <laughs> socks. So there's a shot of that. And Harrison arrives and he plugs in these huge lights. I said, yeah, yeah, and he said. And this is not 60 minutes, 36 of these huge cameras. He plugs in this huge light and a sheet of flame goes up the wall <laughs> in the bedroom. <laughs> so, uh, and then the, this just leads up to one of the strangest moments of my life. Uh, Harrison is a small boat pond at 72nd Street in, in, in Central Park where you sell model boat. Probably you all know where it is, just north of there. And he'd gone in there and he'd set up some trestles under the water and put planking painted dark, just on top of the trestle, so you couldn't see it. And then he brought the cameras and got some robots from the nearest pond, and he rowed us out, him and me, and the cameraman and another thing. And we stood up on this planking, and we began reciting these lines from the, to each other as we walked toward each other, walking on water, <laughs> walking on water. And we said these enigmatic lines and passages. So we did three or four takes, took a couple of hours, and this huge crowd gathers. And uh, we finally rode ashore. And among the crowd is Lillian Ross, who works at the New Yorker, a famous journalist and very close to the editor in many ways, uh, William Sean, standing there with her mouth open. She knew everything about the New Yorker. She said, Roger, you're an actor? And I said, there are many things about me you don't know, but I, well, I walked away. And then Harrison showed this, this mostly completed film to Agnes Varda, a famous French filmmaker, who said it was all crap. It was terrible. Nobody ever saw it. I've never seen a, a foot of it. Who has the copy? No, I don't know. It was never seen, but uh, my movie career. <laughs> um, where should we go? More about that. Well, you wanted to talk about editing, and I'd love to hear you speak on that subject. Well, new writers, or most writers, or most people, I think, are thinking about editing. Editors are people who are there to take a beautiful, original piece of work and, and cut it to pieces and make it ordinary, make it sound like the New Yorker or whatever. <laughs> uh, 
but editing really has to do with the difficulty of writing. It's very hard for writers, no matter how talented they are, to get it right. It's so hard. Um, let's start to let's start with Coturna, to start with the difficulty of writing. Uh, there are very few writers I've ever met who can write a short or a long piece and get it right the first time. Uh, Donald was one of them. He needed very little editing, very light editing. I arrived at the New Yorker as a fiction editor. I'd been an editor at a, another magazine, Holiday Magazine, for 10 years and a contributor to the New Yorker. I arrived in, in 56, 1956, and for the first time saw so edited edited galleys of John Cheever, maybe the greatest fiction writer the New Yorker ever had, the great John Cheever. And there was editing every sentence. Every sentence had required some editing. It was beautifully, beautiful sentences that we all know by heart had required editing and fixing to make them right. Um, Who had done that editing? Um, William Maxwell was one of them. I think for the years, William Maxwell was the editor. Uh, but. What happens if the th hard thing about editing fiction is that you have to edit in the tone of the fiction writer. When I went to work there, Sean gave me the only piece of advice he'd ever given, I'd ever heard from him. He said, it's no great trick to take a piece of fiction and turn it into the greatest piece of fiction, greatest short story ever written. <coughs> it's much harder to make it into the best story this writer could have written. You have to edit in the tone of that writer. And every writer, once they've, want, a first writer once thinks everything is done is, is perfect, and it, it's, it's a horrifying first moment when you suggest that something isn't clear, it's mostly for clarity, uh, or it just doesn't sound the same as it did, or that this, this, the meaning of this is not quite what you maybe think it is, let's think about it, or maybe this paragraph it might be could be a little bit shorter, and made stronger. But real writers develop an affinity and a closeness and intimacy with an editor that lasts for a lifetime. It really does. They count on each other. I've had three editors in my life, and I, I, I would not be able to do anything. First thing I want to do, aside from having my wife read it, which is essential, but, but uh, is to show it to Ann Goldstein, my present editor, before that to Gardner Botsford, before that to William Maxwell. Uh, Maxwell and I, he's a wonderful fiction writer, edited each other. Uh, and we were entirely different as, as editors, but uh, he relied on me, I relied on him. And uh, there's a fact editor, John Bennett, who is retiring right now, this month after many years, and two or three of his writers are absolutely disconsolate. They don't know how they're going to go on. Uh, it's a form of approval. It's a form of making yourself better. Um, writing is so hard. I first saw this with my stepfather, E.B. White, who's one of the great essayists of the century and got a gold medal from the White. You know, everybody knows E.B. White. And Back when I was in my early teens, or before, he was, every week he would write the first page, the notes and comment page, the editorial page of the New Yorker, which when he read it seemed just a snap, a cinch, so easy to read, so unassuming, so flowing. But I heard him every day on Monday or Tuesday, lock himself into a study, and he'd be there all morning long, and the typewriter would be going tap, 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 long pauses. And he'd come out at lunch and not say anything, he'd be pale, and go in there. And then he'd get two mails a day out there, and it would go off in the three o'clock mailbag, and he would say, it's not good enough, it's not good enough. And then it would come back to the magazine, would come back the next week, and he said, well, maybe it's all right. It wasn't, it was better than all right, it was great, but if it was, that, it was that hard for Andy White to write what he wrote, uh, think how hard it is for lesser people to get the same thing done. Uh, the only time writing becomes easy, I think, is if you do it every day. If you're a journalist, uh, you haven't got time for this. But I used to see sports writers working against deadlines, writing like this in the press box all the time, and they're still using typewriters. 
and the greatest one of them all, Red Smith, and one of the best sports writer, the best sports columnist or anywhere, sitting like this. He was a what they call a bleeder, and the the it would very slowly start to come out this beautiful, easy, flowing, funny stuff. Uh, um, Donald, you, you write that you, Donald said you got the hay out of his... Uh, I want you to get the hay out. Well, that just means get out the extraneous stuff. <laughs> I know a great story about, about Donald. In the story Eugenie Grande, which is uh, full of uh, surprises and lists and different things, is talking about her cooking and she's, she does a lot of, puts a lot of butter in her cooking. And then he had, I think, 14 lines of the word butter. Butter, 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 stacked up like this in one column. And we're going to press, and this is, this is a, we're at the end of the, we, we adjust the cartoons and everything, and we're two or three lines short. And I called Donald and I said, can we get rid of maybe two lines of those butters? And he said, two lines, but not a spoonful more. <laughs> 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 um, he he uh, he left he left New York and went to Houston and became a uh, great teacher of fiction there. Well, he was a great teacher. Of a great teacher of fiction here as well, but he, but writing became more difficult for him. He was he was an alcoholic and uh, smoked a lot. He had a Strindberg and beard. He was tall, striking looking. I can remember him coming to parties at my house, and he would sit in my chair, which I always understood. <laughs> I'm here, <laughs> and would look really. You remember how how that bright, expectant look that he had, and then not just from the drinking, but as the evening went on, a sort of a sadness would creep over, and I think there was a persistent sadness in him that. Uh, probably had to do with his father. Um, and while he was still in New York, he was getting, he was getting drunk twice a day. Uh, he would write in the morning, he would have lunch with a couple of martinis and a glass of wine and go home drunk and sleep. And then write in the late afternoon and at dinner get drunk again and over and over again for long, for long periods of time so, and smoking and you, he, his shape changed, and you could see that, that this is not something he can control. And I tried to talk to him about a couple of times about smoking, and he said, I'll know when to stop. But of course, he didn't, and he died. He was 58 years old when he died. Mm. Uh, terrible, terrible loss. And uh, he died within two months of another idol of mine, a baseball idol of mine. Laura Giamatti died two months later at the age of 63 from a, from a heart attack. Uh, and this is something I've written about a lot in my recent and more personal writings. And I have to go back and talk about <coughs> Tina Brown. <coughs> Tina was the, th was the fourth editor of the New Yorker, the first was the founding editor. I, I knew them all and wrote for them all, actually. Uh, Harold Ross founded, the famous Harold Ross founded the magazine, died in his, in the 50s, I think, then Sean took over and for 40 years and stayed too long and uh, was absolutely extraordinary in every way and had acolytes and uh, nobody liked him. And began to think that the New Yorker represented Western civilization itself, he really did. Uh, he was succeeded by Robert Gottlieb, a shocking moment in the history of most of the people working there because Sean had been there forever. And Bob Gottlieb, who had come from Knopf, had been a book editor and was really first class and basically was doing a holding operation to do the Sean thing for at least for a while. And then suddenly here comes Tina Brown, who had been a Brit and had done, what was her other magazine that, uh, that she'd been yeah. Yeah, uh, changed everything. Uh, a lot of people left. Uh, she saved the magazine. The magazine was more abundant. She changed everything about it, and they brought it up to date. Changed its nature. 
made it contemporary, made it sharper. But the great thing she did to me was that she, she said to me over and over, she said, Roger, you've had a really interesting life. And it'd be wonderful if you could write about it. I've never thought of doing this at all. It never occurred to me. She said, write about yourself, write about your family. And she started me. So all this late in life stuff from me about my parents, about E.B. White, about my childhood, about sailing, about, uh, about loss, um, came from her, started with her. Uh, and I think that uh, if I could say anything about myself is that, that uh, the process of writing is still mysterious to me. We were talking about this just before uh, we came here, and this, the passage about uh, Huckleberry Finn. I don't know, have you read this recently? That opening paragraph about Huckleberry Finn, I'm very proud of that paragraph. And so the, your writing brain does things you, you don't know. If you're writing well, if something happens, you don't know what you're doing. And I didn't realize until later, if you read that again, I think that I'm describing what you see, starting up close and going across the river. And then I said, mentioned the straight, straight line of the, of the train tracks at the other end. And I think that the nearer sentences are shorter and the farther the, the phrases or whatever I use, the farther ones lose, use longer words as if the boats are bigger, something like that. This is not something I planned. This is when you look back and you say, not bad, not bad. Uh, and every writer knows this and, and waits for those moments, I think. Uh, it's very mysterious. Uh, let's go let's somewhere on where we're going to go. I'm still missing. I'm still. I was teaching that paragraph to my uh, wow. students just before yeah. I came up here. Yeah. Such, and we were looking at that line, trying to figure out exactly what you were doing there, but but also feeling the mystery of that moment. But as you explained, the, the flow. Well, it's the, the flow, the flow, the north-south flow. Is it, it's uh, <coughs> and it's it's so horrific that book. It's I don't know how I don't know if it's it's much harder for for. An audience like you to read this now because of its, of its references at the time and the fact that uh, Jim is the is demeaned all the way through and is seen as stupid and pushed away and is the is the great hero and the one clear conscience and the most beautiful, admirable human being in the whole book. Which the rest of it is just thieves and rascalians and terrible people that you meet along the way. Uh, amazing, amazing. I, what I found so powerful in the passage was that you brought your own sense of the Hudson to it. So well, if you, if you went, as a kid, as a kid, I lived right next to the Hudson, and you had a sense of this thing going by all the time, this great movement all the time. So it was the first time record, re reading something that was as brilliantly as, as Twain does it. They said, yes, that's the way it is. That's the, that's the way it is. Uh, and you... Uh, <coughs> Good writers do that if this let they do something that is is uh, recognizable to you. It suddenly uh, say, yeah, yeah, that's the way it is. There is a poem by Auden that I memorized some poetry in my old age to to uh, so can I do this? Sure, please. Um, there's a poem called, I have, I have a house in Maine, which is on moving water, and it's, it's a huge tide here up and down, 11 foot tide, and there are lots of islands, and, and tides and currents, and I've done sailing there uh, for ever since I was a kid. Uh, and here's a poem by Auden called Look Stranger. Look, look Stranger on this island now, the leaping light for your delight discovers. Stand stable here and silent be, that through the channels of your ear may wander like a river the silence, the swaying sounds of the sea. Here at the short field's ending, pause, when the chalk wall falls to the foam, and its steep ledges oppose the pluck and knock of the tide, and a gull pauses a moment on its sheer side. Far off, like floating seeds, the ships diverge on urgent voluntary er errands, and the full view indeed may enter and move us 
as now these clouds do, that slowly pass the harbor's mirror and all summer through the water saunter. Now that's, that's a great poem about Maine. And it's absolutely wrong in one thing. <laughs> Completely wrong. The harbor, does, the water does not reflect the pot. Clouds do not reflect on water. They, they shadow water, but they don't reflect. So I don't mind. I mean, it's a great poem. <laughs> and would it be fact-checked at the New Yorker? Well, no. I think it ran in the New Yorker. It could be. But, uh, but that's, I mean, that sounds as if I'm memorizing, memorizing uh, serious or heavy or beautiful poetry. There's also, you know, I, mean, I, edited, I edited for years, I edited Ogden Nash, the famous light, the light verse writer, wonderful light verse writer. And here's another poem that I sometimes say to myself, I'm going to sleep, I'm going to sleep, or walking the dark. There's something about a martini, a tingle remarkably pleasant. A yellow, a mellow martini. I wish that I had one at present. <laughs> There's something about a martini ere the dining and dancing begin. Now, to tell you the truth, it's not the vermouth. I think that perhaps it's the gin. <laughs> um, so let's talk about baseball. Can we do that? People sometimes ask me, why baseball? And, uh, I was, Sean in, in the 60s wanted more sports, and he, he liked people writing about their passions, and he said, you like baseball, right? And I said, sure, and he said, you want to write about it? And I said, yeah, I was in my 30s when I read about it. So I went to spring training and wrote a piece about baseball for the first time, and I had no idea that it would go on for as long as it did, but baseball is a wonderful thing to write about because it's, it's really, it's good for writers because it's leisurely, it has you know, time to take notes and watch things. And it moves, it, it moves sequentially like, like reading or like, like writing. One thing happens, then another thing happens, then something else happens. And then you can see what something connects to something else. And it's all clear, it all happens in front of your eyes. There's never a moment where you don't know what's happened out there. Unlike most other sports where multiple things happen at the same time, you know, never quite clear. But the greatest thing about baseball that people don't really appreciate, and it's still true, is that it's almost impossibly difficult to play. It's the hardest of all sports to play. Great athletes try to play, who never played baseball try, and they, they look ridiculous. Uh, Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player who ever lived, after he'd retired, decided he, would, he was in his 40s, he decided he would like to try to play Major League Baseball or professional baseball. And he really worked hard on this. He got himself in shape and he took some, he took some training and went to spring training with the Braves organization and got assigned to a minor league club in uh, Birmingham and worked hard at it for, I think, most of a season. His manager, Terry Francona, who was the manager of the Cleveland Indians in the World Series just this past, told me that he was a fabulous athlete and he couldn't hit. He just couldn't hit. He just couldn't do it. Just could not do it. Uh, could he catch? Well, he did everything else, but he couldn't hit. He couldn't hit. And uh, so uh, this is, this is, uh, I, 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 let me, let me talk about well, I love to talk about reporting and writing and reporting. This is not like fiction writing, it's a different thing. Some tricks and things I've learned about with great difficulty uh, over the years from writing about baseball. When I first went, I was scared to death and I sat, sat in the stands. Uh, it was the first year of the New York Mets in 1969. And uh, I sat in the stands and wrote about the Mets fans and it was a big Mets Mets fans were a huge uh, story because the New York Giants had left a couple of years before. There was no National League team, and this terrible team, one of the worst teams in the history of baseball, was playing. There was a lot of losing, and uh, I wrote about that. But eventually, I got up my courage and began talking with managers and pitchers and hitters, and I wanted to be them to think that I knew what they were talking about. So. They'd start to tell me something, and I would go like this. Let's be doing conversation. I'd go like this. 
and they wouldn't say very much. And it took me a while. I learned this from from uh, 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 John uh, and, and I'm sorry, John and New Jersey, and New Jersey the great. McPhee. John McPhee, excuse me, thank you, my brain's real. He said, be stupid, be stupid. And it's hard to learn this. And if somebody is talking to you and you're taking notes and they're talking about something that's slightly complicated to you, and they think, well, this guy isn't very bright, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to help him out. So then they begin to talk and you begin to write. If you nod, you wanna be in the know, they'll stop, but if you go, huh? What? <laughs> and I tried it in my class. Really? Really? It's, it's, amazing. it's amazing. And the other thing is to collect talk. I wrote long baseball pieces and uh, about the end of the whole season sometimes. Some, I wrote a whole series of pieces about how to play baseball, how to play, how to catch, how to play infield, how to hit long 15, 20,000 word pieces. And I've talked to dozens and dozens of ball players. And uh, you can't do this now because the, the age of the interview is over. Everybody tweets and they, they write for themselves and you, they will not take the time to talk to you anymore. So I was very lucky. But uh, I collected guys who could talk in paragraphs and I just write down exactly what they said. Roger Craig, who, a manager who was the Invented the split finger fastball. Uh, Joe Torrey, the great manager of the Yankees. Uh, a guy named Ted Simmons, who was a catcher for the Cardinals and a brilliant man, and on the side, a collector of American furniture of all sorts, <coughs> all kinds of things. I couldn't get him to talk to me. I couldn't get him to talk to me. I knew how smart he was, and I followed him around. I once mentioned American furniture to him, and he said, Hold it right there. He said, I don't know if you know anything about American furniture or not. Maybe if you do, I didn't know anything about American furniture. Maybe if you do, we can have a talk here. But besides, my insurance agent has told me not to talk about my furniture collection. <laughs> but I couldn't get him. So one day in spring training in, in Sun City, Arizona, he had been on the field as a catcher, and he'd left early, and I went to the clubhouse and there he was, and I started hopelessly trying to talk to him, and he was, he was not giving me anything, not giving me the time of day. And I said, Ted, you're a switch hitter. You're a right-hander, but I noticed that you're better left-handed than right-handed. Why is that? And he said, why do you think that is? And just to the back of my head, I said, well, of course, you're throwing the ball back to the pitcher all the time after every pitch, so maybe your right hand on the bat is too strong. And he looked at me and he said, I don't think, I didn't think you would have noticed that. And after that, he was mine. I'd stepped over some water. I'd stepped on, I'd seen enough, and I couldn't shut him up. He was just, he was, he did paragraph after paragraph. For me, I just write it down. Wonderful man, extraordinary. Um, the other thing that people don't understand about baseball is how much the players care. They really, really care. The Cleveland Indians have just lost this World Series. We'll be thinking about this until after Christmas, every day, every day. They get huge amounts of money, but what they want is to do well and to look good. Their pride is involved. Um, it's, uh, um, I did a book with my only front-to-back book written. I did a book called A Picture Story with a Yankee pitcher named David Cohn, a great right-hander with a wonderful slider curve ball and a strikeout artist who uh, was immensely skilled, very bright guy. He was the brightest union guy of the whole, whole American League, spoke for the whole American League during the long baseball negotiations. And, He'd asked me if I'd like to write a book with him, and I said, fine, we didn't have a written agreement. So we started off in the year 2000, and uh, I spent some time with him, and he can't win, he's lost his slider. Uh, he's, kept, he's lost and lost and lost all year long, I was there every night, and he couldn't, he didn't know what had gone wrong, and he lost his position on the team, and as a spokesman for the team, and he never broke the, I, I, I kept saying to him, losing 
is more interesting than winning. And he would say, if you say so. Uh, and he did not, he did not, he could have just walked away, and he never did. He stayed with it right to the end. Amazing. People want to tell you their stories. This is, this is an essential, essential, remarkable thing. Janet Malcolm wrote a famous piece saying that every, every journalist is, is cheating, the, is cheating the subject, is taking, the, taking something and changing it for their own end. But I find that people want to tell you their stories. I went up in 1981. I had some, some long letters from a, from a young woman named Linda Kittle, who was a poet at, at uh, University of Vermont, and was married to, or not then yet married, was uh, going with a pitcher named Ron Goebel, a, a tall, skinny guy. Uh, and they've been, they've been playing at the lowest level of the minor leagues out in South Dakota. And she'd been writing me long letters about this. And there was a baseball strike, and I went up, and I spent about a week and a half with them, going everywhere with them. They were playing semi-pro ball at the lowest level. This is playing in the uniforms of a major league team, but on the back, the name of some local concern, like a garage or a meat shop or a liquor store on the back. Uh, he took this with deadly seriousness, and so did she. This was immense. He thought about each performance of his pitching. He was a pretty good pitcher, but he couldn't pitch better, higher than this level. And he took it with the same seriousness that major league pitchers uh, take it. And after that week, the end of the week, she suddenly said to me, I could go on about that wonderful week I had with him, but too much time, but at the end of the week, we did everything, went everywhere. At one point, they were driving to a little ballpark, and, they stopped the car and he got out and got a folding sign like that and put it on the road. It said, baseball tonight, and put it on the road. <laughs> and then she was out there selling tickets beforehand, and I was standing with her. And the car came by, and she said, hi, and he went in, I looked at the license plate, it said, ump, U-M-P. Uh, <laughs> this is all at very low level. But at the end of the week, she said, we've given you our lives. Uh, and they have, they really have. So I had to be very attentive to pay attention to what I was saying about them, what I thought about them, and do it right. When I started up with David Cohn, I went, the beginning of spring training, I went down, and he was living in a gated community in Tampa where the, the Yankees trained. And uh, I went to his house for the first evening, got a first afternoon, got a tape recorder and started talking to him about his, <coughs> his childhood in, in Kansas City where he'd grown up. His father was a meat, worked in a meat packing plant and was a big union organizer and uh, he had a couple of brothers and a sister. Uh, they were, it's C-O-N-E, there's Irish, not Jewish, not Cohen, C-O-N-E, Irish descent. And, uh, he started talking about his father, who had been an addition to his the main person in his life, and his, his coach was an alcoholic, and who, if there was any infraction, had kept a stick behind the door and would beat him and his sons and, and abuse him, hit him with a stick. And I wrote all this down. I wrote, paid attention, put it all on the tape, on the tape for an hour and a half. And at the end of that time, Lynn, his wife, had been in another part of the room, came over to me and she said, I've never heard most of this before, ever. So he chose me to tell the story. And I think because I was older, in a sense I was his therapist or something like this. And my responsibility was to be sure he wanted to say this in type. And I went back to him again and again. I said, you want this in the story? And he said, yes, I do want it. And I put that in, his father, I knew his father, who would stop drinking, and was a silent guy, and I sat in the stands with his father and mother. I knew this what had happened long ago. But David wanted it in the book, and his sisters and brothers, his sister never forgave me for this, but David wanted it there. Um, so it's, it's very moving and, and uh, significant to try to get this right and to try to these these are these are lives. And the ball club, the managers I always respected were the ones who treated their ball players like human beings. Joe Torrey 
Joe Torre never threw a play, never threw a player under the bus. No matter how bad things were going with that player, the, the Yankees press corps, thirty people or so around them every after every game, and would talk about somebody who's in a terrible slump, and he would say, "Jerry is not very proud of his at bats right now." He would turn the always turn the subject back to the player. So that you stop looking at him as somebody who was about to fail or fall out of sight. Uh, so and so is, 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 has it doesn't like what his what his uh, slide is doing right now. Always without without fail. Um, <coughs> Terry was was a manager for the Judge the Impossible George Steinbrenner, who insisted on winning all the time, and there was heavy pressure on the players to win all the time, every day, and he had fired a bunch of managers, but Torrey, who was an extraordinarily balanced and, <coughs> and uh, resilient and intelligent guy, rode with this. And the last year, when they were getting rid of him, I think it was 2008, uh, they were decided to change managers. So, and Torrey said, uh, my players know the what's expected, know the conditions around here. And it's blood that flows through their veins. Uh, amazing thing to say. And when he talked about himself, he'd been a great player with the Cardinals and great catcher and head of the labor with the Mets. And he'd won a National League batting championship, batted 378 one year. But the year he talked about was the next following year when his average went down by 90 points. And he always talked about that year. And then he talked about the time in a game late in his career when he came up to play against the Giants for one game and batted into four double plays for a new national in the same game, for a new national league record. And his players loved him for this. They loved him because there's so much losing in baseball. Mike Messina, the great player, said, I'll play for him any day. So you meet remarkable people like that. Um, the Pirates manager, Jim Leland, I was with once. Um, and he had just been talking to a young player, and he'd sent him back down to the minors. And I said, I said, did you tell him he'd be back? And he said, no. He said, he's not going to be back. These are lives. I said, he's not going to be back. And I wished him well, but I did not tell him he's going to be back here. Most managers don't do that. Um, there, are, there are lighter stories, too, that, uh, going back to the, 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 the quotable players, uh, I went out one spring training once out to Scottsdale and Roger Craig, the manager of the, the, manager of the Giants, was out in left field and I went out with a friend of mine, a writer, we shook hands and my friend said, Roger, meaning me, has a new book out to Roger Craig. Have you read it? And Craig said, read it? Hell, I wrote half of it. <laughs> that line is true from your own book. Yeah. <laughs> one thing in your book puzzled me. You said you became a Boston Red Sox fan at one point. Well, I was a Red Sox fan because I, I, uh, the Yankees had won with so much regularity over the years that uh, uh, being up in New England, they really cared. And, and for a long time, I, I loved the 1967 Red Sox, which uh, uh, almost won. And uh, there's so much losing, so much pain. And uh, uh, when they were in the World Series, I wrote about people all over New England passing the lobster men, telling the score, passing the score back and forth. Uh, a lot of caring and a lot of, uh, a lot of. Uh, I was a traumatized uh, child. <laughs> up the Red Sox losing yeah. and the Braves yeah. But then they won, and it was less fun, actually. Wasn't it less fun? No. Almost winning is more no, fun. They were there. Almost they winning. Were there. Almost winning is more fun. Um, actually, I actually have a strange story about that one. They were just about to win the pennant. They, the game was on in the living room of a friend of mine up in Amherst. I said, please don't let me watch it because yeah. something terrible will happen. Yeah. Oh, you're crazy. Yeah. And she, that was when they lost it in the ninth inning. Wow, 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 wow. But do you have that feeling that somehow your personality is magically... Uh, no, but Peggy does. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
That's what I said. <laughs> That's right. Okay. There's a lot of, oh my God, with Peggy. And she started watching. She really good too. We just got married. The, the Giants were independent in, 19, in 2014. And uh, there was a wonderful Giants player named Hunter Pence. And she said, Peggy kept saying, Hunter Pants? Underpants? Underpants? What was his brother thinking? Underpants? Think what he went through in, 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 in junior, in uh, elementary school. Underpants? Underpants? <laughs> and the Giants had a fabulous picture. They were winning, winning every other year, winning world championships, named Madison Bumgarner. Madison Bumgarner. And, uh, and the Giants each, each time got into the, got into the, the playoffs in the World Series by being one of the wild card teams. Uh, and the first time you pit, played against the Pirates, he's chucked them out. And I wrote about the Tigers, the Pittsburgh fans at home that night thinking about that name. Name grabs your mind, which is an anagram for Madison. <laughs> name grabs your mind. <laughs> But there's so much pain, again, to go back to the pain. Here are the Pirates who got into the, a wonderful team, really good team, got into that wild card playoff, two years running, and never scored a run in either game. Not zero each time, two years running. I mean, this, 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 we've just seen the pain of a 77 game World Series, but if you think about it, all these 30 odd teams come down to with one winner in the end, and the, in the end, everybody has lost. Can I get some questions from out there? Does anybody want to say about that? Yeah. Uh, very quickly, uh, you write a lot about uh, sports and, and, and well, baseball and champions, but there's a lot of failure. You mentioned that there's a lot of yeah. failure, and you wrote a wonderful story about a pitcher. I think it's for oh, Steve Blass. Yes. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he lost it. Yeah. Amazing. Extraordinary. An extraordinary story. Steve Blass was a pitcher with the Pirates who the year before had lost their, their great star, uh, Roberto Clemente, in a plane crash. A fabulously dynamic, extraordinary player. And, uh, he was flying some, from, uh, I think from, not from Puerto Rico, made, uh, uh, flying a load of supplies to a, a uh, place in Mexico, I think, that had, a, had an earthquake and the plane crashed and he died. And the whole team was changed. But Blast was a pitcher with that team, and had had great success and had won a World Series. Is a great picture of him, the winning pitcher. And suddenly in this year, he can't pitch at all. He can't get the ball over the plate. He pitched a little bit, and suddenly, wild and inexplicable, pitches behind every everybody. And for a year and a half, he had struggled with this, and he could not could not figure it out. Some psychological thing had happened to him, and. I went and asked if he had just left baseball after a year and a third of this agony. And I went, I called him and said, Can I come and visit him? And he said, Sure. And I came and I spent a week with him. And he took me around to, to, to games and to little league games with his kids <coughs> and uh, told me all about this and told me everything except the fact that he was seeing a psychiatrist by this point, which he kept secret. And. Uh, I talked with his teammates and with his managers, and uh, a very, a very strange and mysterious thing, uh, unparalleled in baseball. Uh, and he, the one thing he didn't like about it after I, it came out, his father had been a plumber in uh, Connecticut, and. Uh, I called the piece down the drain, which is what players say after they leave the majors. And he objected to this. I later changed him to the book. The government changes to going for good. He said, you know we're going down the drain. So he said, didn't like that. But I saw him again for the first time last year, and we had a great reunion. One of the things that struck me about your pieces on baseball, particularly, was the lament for the way the, the landscape of the Fox had changed, the whole aura that used to surround the <coughs> well, this is one of the great complaints about about uh, 
from fans about steroids and, and <coughs> changing the great steroid scandal and people getting all this money and injecting drugs and everything. It's affecting the integrity of the game, which it was, but the rules were very vague when they started. And uh, people didn't quite know what was going on. It's under control now, it really is. There, there's, there's no such thing and the, the testing is, is going on. Uh, they took away amphetamines which was a big loss because players play every single day. Amphetamines are greenies. They lift you up. You take them if you're taking an exam. So I don't know if you'll, you'll still take if you have a three three hour exams in two days. You take a greenie, but you can't do that in baseball anymore. And the quality of baseball went down because the players are more fatigued. But uh, <coughs> I've lost my point here for the moment. I was really curious no. about the. The stadiums uh, themselves. No, the stadiums. Yeah, I'm going on, but uh, <laughs> baseball. And baseball, right? I talked about the home run record. It said baseball's most hallowed, hallowed mark, the home run record. And but each new ballpark has been designed to allow more home runs, and also each ballpark was different. Players were playing in different distances. So as I wrote at some point, this is like running the Olympic keeping the record for the Olympic 100 meter dash at distances of 94 meters, 109 meters, <laughs> and two meters, the, the, the dimensions aren't the same. And then the, ball, the new ballpark started cutting down on, on the outer part of the outfield uh, where the curves around, it goes from right field, which is near here, around to center field, which is a little closer to this great curve, which is, makes it much more distance. They cut that off for home runs. And so the home runs went up. And the owners did this, and they're still talking about the integrity of baseball. And I, I, I mean, I, I tend to be on the player's side. Uh, it's, it's strange to play. It's, the baseball has totally changed. Uh, the whole atmosphere has changed. Um, it's part of the huge 24-hour cycle of, base, of sports that we have. There's always, you turn your, your TV on, there's always a sport going on 24 hours, uh, and it's immediate. And if something happens as a replay, you know what happened. Uh, the replay, re, I, I, once, I once compared the replay to pornographic film. Uh, and I'm, just wait, just wait a second. Before the instant replay, we would watch, see some amazing thing happen, an amazing catch, an amazing uh, performance, or some, something just happened on the field. We go, wow, did you see that? Wow. Now the replay, there's something happens, and then you look it up there, and then you say, yes, there it is. That's the way I look at it. Look at that. And then they do it again, and you say, yeah, yes, yeah, they got it right. And then again, say, yeah, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's <laughs> One of the players you interview doesn't want to see his great moment because he wants to hold on to it. Yes, yeah, uh, the great, uh, the great uh, Red Sox catcher, Carlton Fisk, who hit a, in, the, in the famous 1975 World Series against the Cincinnati Reds, he had a game-winning 11th inning home run over the, just went up, just past the foul pole and left field's one of the famous moments in baseball footage of it coming down the line, looking at the ball, and it just goes by a fair and felt me if I start jumping up and down like this and runs around the bases. And we were talking with it about instant replay with, with Fitz and other people, and I said, what private memory do you have of that moment? And he said, it's funny you ask that, because whenever I see that coming up on the screen, I leave the room, because I want to keep the memory of what it was like. I want to keep it crystal clear, not see it again. Well, we, you said you were going to stop this after 20 minutes, and it's All now right. been an hour. Okay. So I'm happy I'm to go on and on, but no, I'm not I'm sure it would be fair to you. 